Half a century ago, a defeated army was rescued from the shores of northern France. In the space of nine days, and against all the odds, a third of a million men were lifted from these beaches at Dunkirk and escaped across the Channel to England. In less than one month, the British Expeditionary Force, along with its French and Belgian allies, had been routed by the might of the German army and trapped with their backs against the sea and most of their equipment lost. An armada of ships, ships of every size and description, braved continual air attacks, shelling and mines to save the hordes of exhausted men. What had gone so terribly wrong? Why did a modern European army suffer one of the biggest military defeats of all time? What was the miracle of Dunkirk? It was a miracle insofar that all these thousands of troops were saved. I don't know the figure, but it's in every book. Thousands and thousands of a defeated and retreating army were brought back. But there was more than that. The miracle was in the weather. For a whole week, the sea was as calm as a mill pond. If we hadn't have stayed there or hadn't have dug in or asked to do a rear guard action, well, the tanks would have got down to the beaches and I don't think any of the men had got off the beaches. They'd have been taken prisoner. Either that or killed. And everybody helped everybody else. And there was no question of, well, I'm not going to do that sort of thing. They would have stubbed on their head if they had to. The catastrophe at Dunkirk in May and June of 1940 has become part of our national folk memory. Like a talisman, the very name has come to represent a sort of muddling through with our backs against the wall. The myth helped sustain the British people through five more years of war. What had been a national disaster was turned by wartime propaganda into a glorious deliverance, the triumphant and heroic return of our boys. It's a vanity! They've got her, Mr. Olden! They've got her! Now, of course, Dunkirk was a great defeat for the British, and I think it was right that historians have been at pains to point out there was too much euphoria immediately after the event, presenting this as some sort of, of um, remarkable triumph. It wasn't a triumph, but I don't regard it as a myth. It was a unique national moment. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. Cheerio, here I go on my way. The BEF, the British Expeditionary Force that went to France in September 1939, was going to need all the luck it could get. The army was ill-equipped and poorly trained. The British government had done almost nothing to modernize its forces in the face of the growing military power of Germany. To our shame, said Montgomery, a divisional commander at the time, we have sent our army into that most modern of wars with weapons and equipment that were quite inadequate. Exercises were, were held in, in the summer of 1939 and watched um, with amazement by German military observers, furthermore, in which, uh, in which soldiers went forward carrying pieces of wood and, and lengths of gas pipe to resemble anti-tank guns or, or uh, shuffling along with a piece of cardboard to, to pretend that they were riding in a lorry. It was a period known as the Phony War. Commanded by General Lord Gort of Limerick, the army idled away its time in northern France, deluded by absurd self-confidence. 
The Allied High Command in Paris under the French General Gamelin was locked in an outdated First World War mentality with no real spirit to fight again, having already suffered such terrible losses. This time the French sat secure behind the fortifications of the Maginot Line. Now imagine me in the Maginot Line, sitting on a mine in the Maginot Line. The Dutch and Belgians proclaimed themselves neutral in the vain hope of escaping the attentions of Hitler's Third Reich. I'm not French as you can see, but I know what they mean when they say we, we, down on the Maginot Line. Britain and France remained, as always, uneasy and reluctant allies. Now it's turned out nice again, the army life is fine. At night myself to sleep I sing, to my old tin hat I cling. I have to use it now for everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of truth in that, I know. I think that the, the British army you had there, with the quality of equipment, the very poor quality of command, the very indifferent grasp of tactics. I don't believe that that army could have defeated that immensely professional German force at that moment. But the British army was paying the price for many, many years of neglect. The long expected German offensive was started on the 10th of May. Overnight, Hitler's well rehearsed Blitzkrieg had begun. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a short news bulletin. The German army invaded Holland and Belgium early this morning by land and by landings from parachutes. The armies of the Low Countries are resisting. Abandoning defences they'd spent all winter preparing, the British Army and the 1st and 7th French Armies, a force of over a million men, advanced forward into Belgium to stop the German attack. But they were doomed from the start. In a ragged collection of coal trucks and removal vans, the Allied Army eagerly sprang north into position. No one guessed then that just four days later, they would all be dashing back in the opposite direction. We moved forward into Belgium, and I, I personally remember that I thought this was going quite, rather well, rather smoothly. Uh, and then suddenly, of course, uh, we came under attack and started to fall back as the Germans came round the flanks. I could have wept for joy, said Hitler. They've fallen into the trap. The Allied response had been exactly what the Führer had wanted. The attack in the north had been a diversion. With the Allied armies moving north, seven panzer divisions, backed up by motorized units, had broken through the Ardennes to the south. Bypassing the Maginot Line, they were across the River Meuse. The immensely powerful and mobile German columns made huge advances, 30 to 40 miles a day, unknown in war before. All serious French resistance collapsed, and the main road was open to the sea. I was shocked wrote Churchill, by the utter failure to grapple with the German armour, which with a few thousand vehicles was compassing the entire destruction of mighty armies. The British forces began to pull back to prevent themselves from being cut off from the coast. One soldier who saw more than most of that withdrawal was dispatch rider Peter Andrews. Well, this road is pretty familiar. Way back in 1940, it was literally chopper block with refugees, British, French, Belgian lorries, all going in one direction towards Dunkirk. And the Germans were bombing round the clock. Again at night, you would see the mothers putting the children to bed under trees and bushes and quite well-to-do people come in and asking you for food, which sadly you couldn't give them. Quite often when you took shelter in the ditches, you took them with French and Belgian women and children. And although I suppose we've got used to total war now, I wasn't used to it then. There's one mass of 
burns, blown up vehicles. Some have been pushed off the road. Others lay on their sides. There were dead bodies and bits of body all over the place. In fact, it was a real terrible carnage, I think. It's the sort of scene that lives with you forever. The number of people who, uh, who died along this road. In nine days, German armored units had reached the sea at Abbeville, dividing the Allied armies in two. The French high command, encouraged by Churchill, ordered Lord Gort to sever the German advance and join up with the French in the south. But the British counterattacks failed through lack of adequate supplies, ammunition and support. Realizing that the BEF was in great danger of being surrounded, Lord Gort, against orders from the Allied High Command, decided to move north. It was at this stage of the battle that units from the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, the Cheshires and the Royal Artillery, told to cover the retreat, were to suffer one of the worst atrocities of the war. Uh, but these orders came through that we got all this position at all costs irrespective of life. We must hold it. And of course we held it as long as we possibly could hold it. But I mean with one anti-tank rifle or two anti-tank rifles, a few brain guns, they haven't got any, uh, any more ammo to send down. And I mean, what chance have you got against great big tanks? You haven't. I mean, uh, nobody's ever been known, not even with a rifle, to stop a tank. We fell back towards the river Beck and uh, of course some of them jumped in the water i couldn't swim so i just stood on the top and because behind these tanks was ss troops who had, had followed up the infantry who had followed up behind the back of the tanks and uh, they just we just put our arms up and we was taken prisoner and then we was taken up onto the road where we were searched and uh, all identity kits, all uh, rings, watches, everything was taken off you. We had nothing. The uh, Captain Lynn Allen, who was in, with us at the time, because he was the company commander of D Company at that time, uh, he had his revolver removed, the rings and his wallet and his identity disc removed from him. From then on, we was doubled and frog marched across the fields to this barn. Well, some of the men were already wounded, got shrapnel wounds and that, and uh, some fell to the ground, was stabbed with a bayonet, kicked, butted with a rifle and everything. Anyway, when we got to this barn entrance, we was all bundled into the barn, pushed in the back. Well, Captain Lynn Allen and me was the last two to enter the barn. The captain, pleaded with the one tall SS man and said, look, uh, have you got a drink or s can some of these men sit down? He said, yellow Englishman, where you are going, there is a point of no return. And upon that, he reached in his jack boot for a grenade, threw it. Whether I caught the blast of that grenade, I don't know. I dropped to the floor. And in that matter of a few seconds, the captain caught hold of my, this arm, my good arm, dragged me out the barn as the SS were taking cover from the explosions of the grenades, round the back of the barn, and we went about uh, three to four hundred yards to a pool, a stagnant pool at the end. The captain, he said to me, Evans, he said, you get in there, get as low as you can in the water, keep your arm out of the water if you can, and stay there. I'll get over this side, right over the far side of the pool he went. And it was only afterwards they dragged some of the men out, five, uh, five at a time, and shot them through the back. After they'd been, had the grenades and, everything, and the automatic firing in the barn, 
those were still alive, they just dragged them out and shot them to the back on time. And I mean, Parry, they opened his mouth and fired a revolver in, into his mouth. Anyway, one must have followed us down to the pool. This guard that followed us down fired point-blank range at the officer and I seen his, his head just split open. Killed him outright. He disappeared under the water. Upon that, he fired at me. The two bullets hit the tree, ricocheted off the tree and hit me in the back of the neck. I slumped in the water, then I went down, right down in the water and he thought he'd finish me off. But he hadn't. Over 80 men were massacred that day. A handful survived, buried under bodies or left for dead. The British and some French rearguard actions had bought valuable time for the retreating troops. If such sacrifices had not been made, it's doubtful whether there would have been any escape at Dunkirk. Private Bert Evans lost his right arm and spent the next three years haunted by nightmares, a prisoner of war in Poland. The only thing that puzzled me with all this lot, they never found the officer's body. It's different killing an officer and killing men. And that was the more important, you see. Because his body was never found and nobody knows. A very courageous gentleman, very courageous gentleman. I, uh, well, I owe my life to him because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. The 24th of May saw one of the most controversial events of the battle for France. The German high command ordered the tanks to stop. For two days, the panzer stood still. It was the break the Allies needed. Along the canals and waterways around Dunkirk, the BEF hurriedly set up a final defensive line. But why, with only 10 miles to go, had Hitler hesitated? The reasons, as far as I've been able to discover, were the reluctance of a, a First World War corporal, which is what he had been, who had been involved in, in, in the fighting in Flanders, to risk his precious uh, panzer divisions in, in what he regarded as a swamp. Uh, he wanted to save them for the push south and the important prestige of capturing Paris. Uh, so he halted those panzers to give them a two-day rest, and, and that was, was vital to the, the British and the French in allowing them to consolidate a bridgehead around Dunkirk where, where none had previously existed. Meanwhile, back in England, the War Office had already begun to gather all available vessels should an evacuation be necessary. Behind the white cliffs of Dover, dug into the chalk, is a system of tunnels. Here, on the 26th of May, Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey began Operation Dynamo, the urgent evacuation of the BEF. In these tunnels, Behind a veil of security, Ramsey's team worked round the clock to coordinate the hazardous task of bringing over 300,000 men back across the channel. The official target was a mere 45,000 men. After two days, the Admiralty thought it likely that the beaches would be overwhelmed by the enemy. The first ships were urgently ordered across to the harbour at Dunkirk. It was an amazing sight. Before dawn, we could see the glow of Dunkirk, which was rather tragic, like a great ball of fire and black smoke rising from it. And that sort of blacked out everything else, really. Then as it slowly got light, we could begin to see this line of beach going along towards Dunkirk. And there were just hundreds, thousands of groups, thousands of troops all the way along down. And so our captain, took us in and then uh, began to swing round and at that moment a bombing attack started. And uh, we had to get that ship in, fire off our guns at the same time. And how we achieved it I still don't understand, but at the end of this colossal attack we found ourselves just about alongside. 
To organize the evacuation, a naval beach party of 12 officers and 160 ratings was put ashore. One of the beach masters was Lieutenant Stanley Nettle. When we uh, disembarked, there was an air raid going on, and that was the first time I'd heard uh, a bomb coming down, and particularly these screaming bombs, where they attached a, a fin to the bomb. And as it was accelerating coming down, the, the noise got fiercer and fiercer until it became an absolute shriek. And uh, you felt that it was hitting you at the top of your spine, the back of your head, and you instinctively braced yourself because it felt as though it was coming straight for you. When we got ashore, a naval officer said, follow me, lads, and set off to lead us through the bombed out dockyards and harbour buildings. Um, we're climbing through rubble and burning buildings, bodies lying about in the rubble. We never see anything like it before in our lives. And I remember vividly, we were just going over an iron bridge, over a canal, and there in the road, scattered all over the place, were about a dozen British soldiers, or parts of British soldiers. I think the truck they were in must have been hit by a bomb, and they'd been scattered, limbs off, torso, bleeding. They were all dead, and we couldn't do a thing about it. We were under bombing attack ourselves, and we had to haste on to follow our officer. This is the actual film, shot from the cockpit of a German Stuka as it attacked the town of Dunkirk. The Luftwaffe were now bombing and raiding throughout the daylight hours. The German tanks were closing in on all fronts. The ports of Calais and Boulogne had fallen, and another body blow was yet to come. On the 28th of May, the Belgian king, Leopold III, surrendered. Suddenly, a yawning gap of 20 miles was opened up on the British left flank. German units were now able to get to the beach. The 3rd Division, led by Major General Montgomery, moved 25 miles overnight and plugged the gap to the east. The French 1st Army held the front to the west. By now, thousands of soldiers were streaming towards the coast, destroying their equipment as they went. In the middle days of the last week, in the 24th, 5th and 6th of May, a lot of troops hurried to Dunkirk and the scenes there were not particularly savoury. The officer in charge of embarkation there was very bitter in a report that he wrote immediately afterwards. He accused many officers of deserting their men. He cited instances of ambulance drivers taking their vehicles to the docks and abandoning the wounded inside the vehicles while they got on board the hospital ships themselves. Uh, he also uh, gave examples of military policemen abandoning their duties and jumping onto the ships. It was, in other words, it was just uh, Jack wants to go first and that was, that was it in, in many cases. Along 15 miles of gently shelving sandy beaches in ever-growing numbers, groups of worn-out and demoralized soldiers waited in the shallows, grabbing anything that would carry them out to the bigger ships lying up to a mile offshore. I saw a lifeboat coming in on the tide and an arrowhead formation of troops going out to it. And they went in up to about their chest, tried to clamber aboard over the side, it's overturned and sank. So I thought, well, this is a silly sort of business. Anyway, one hour later, another one came floating in. Now, the same thing happened. So I thought, I'll have to do something about this. So when a third one was coming in, they were still going out. I went out into the water alongside them and told them to wait until it came into shallow water. But they still pressed on, and I don't suppose they'd seen anybody with two wavy stripes on their arm in a blue uniform, but they took no notice of me. So I drew my revolver and fired in front of the first man, about two yards in front of him. And uh, they all pulled up and looked, and 
I waved them back to the shore and told them to go back. And then I admire the discipline of the British soldiers because several of them had rifles and they could have dealt with me very quickly. But they went back and I detailed two of them to go out, pull the boat into shallow water, turn it round head to seaward and made them get in over the stern and then push it out. And, and that's the way it went on uh, from then onwards. Along the south coast of England, boatloads of battered troops were pouring onto the quayside. But three days into Operation Dynamo, only 26,000 soldiers had been rescued, half the expected number. With Dunkirk Harbour ablaze, the Navy now began to concentrate on getting the men off the beaches. It was painfully slow, too slow. A destroyer would take all day to fill up, ferrying about 800 men out in small lifeboats to the deeper water, whilst being attacked with a murderous hail of machine gun fire and bombs. By the fourth day, orderly rows of fighting troops were resolutely waiting their turn to leave. Some waited for days before their chance came. Bill Murdoch and Peter Andrews were there. I think we got to the beach, Peter. I think we must have been on the beach at the same time. Yes. My first recollections was, first of all, the knots of army people. Mm -hmm. Some were in orderly rows, but there was a lot of knots of people. And I remember, of course, the, the oil uh, containers remember, yes, I remember ablaze those. up at Dunkirk. Yes. And the day, or one of the days I was here, I remember the, the smoke which was rising very, very high into the sky. Yes. It was sort of moving this way which occurred to me at the time, well, that wouldn't uh, help the German Luftwaffe no, pilot. No, no, it did uh, blot it out. A but bit I just... remember it well, and certainly the, the Navy, I, I've never been so pleased to see the Navy in my life, but the show they put up against the Luftwaffe was tremendous. Starboard lights, flaming yes. onions, the lot. Yes, it yes, was very that's true. Did you get shell fire, Bill? Yes. Yes, I got, we got the shell fire. Uh, was the... that on the Thursday? Well, uh, yes, Thursday, afternoon, I said, well, there must be firing ACAC shells to go off just above the beach. Between the two, I'd rather be bombed than shelled. There's something uh, terribly frightening about a, a shell fire. Yes, uh, especially when you can't hear them coming. That's it. Those things, yeah. you couldn't hear them coming. But at least you can see the aircraft. You can see the air and you can see the bomb. And <laughs> <laughs> if you've got time, you can run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't know, really. I think I prefer shelling to bombing. I'm opposite to you. Really? Yes, I think oh, no, I prefer no, the no, shells no. rather than the bombs. Yes. I feel the bombing, especially dive bombing, is a very personal thing. Away from the coast, the RAF were trying to stop the raiders before they reached their targets. For the soldiers, it seemed as if they'd been completely deserted. Bill Murdoch was one of the few airmen to be evacuated from the beach. I was very, very unpopular. And many, many times, um, an army chap would come up to me and grab me by the lapels and say, where the hell is your aircraft? And it wasn't always possible to explain to him that I had left it back in Belgium and the other two chaps were killed. It was pretty rugged. With the harbour out of action and the beach under fire, the Navy was forced to gamble. Stretching out from the harbour entrance were two breakwaters, or moles. Undamaged, the east mole ran almost a mile straight out to sea. It was never intended for vessels to moor alongside, and it was swept by a ferocious cross tide. But the senior naval officer at Dunkirk took the chance and ordered the first ship in to pick up troops. In 20 minutes, it was possible to pack 800 men onto a destroyer and race back to Dover. A valuable escape route had been discovered. But on the 29th of May, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the first heavy air raid on the mole began. These are the actual pictures of that raid. stationed myself at the entrance to the East Pier where the soldiers were all coming down in thousands in single file out onto the pier. And they looked so dejected and tired. 
many of them calling, they, they recognised me as a sailor. <laughs> I was rather dishevelled and <laughs> had a week's growth of beard and whatnot. They say, what, what do the people at home think of us? That's their main question. What do the people at home think about us? So uh, I try to cheer them up by saying that the people are there welcoming you home. They're ready to welcome you. They think you've done a good job. Now, buck your ideas up, get your shoulders back, you know. I was trying to jock him on the last few steps. <laughs> and so I'm called out and said, thank God we've got a Navy. He said, the Navy are a good ability to take my father off. And now the Navy are here to take me off. And they were very thankful. Despite the attacks, by the fifth day, the Navy were embarking over 30,000 men a day from the mole. And I, there was a man on the quayside, I think he was in the Navy. Well, we got him in, and in the end, we took him in because he was absolutely at the end. He'd been about a fortnight on the quayside and trying to direct things, and I don't think he had very little sleep at all. Eight hospital ships went to Dunkirk. The St. David made a total of three trips and spent 15 hours filling up with wounded. There were six Queen Alexandra's nurses on board. Some of the troops waiting who'd been on the road for goodness knows how long, and they looked absolutely at the end of the tether. And the colonel said, uh, we got some room, they could have come in if they, if you lay down your arms, because you see, they could, we couldn't take to armed people. If you lay down your arms, you can come in uh, with us. But none of them would, so none of the British Army did it. So they all stayed and took potluck was what was coming to them, right. which I thought was marvellous. Wounded soldiers, some terribly hurt, managed to get themselves onto the mole. One was Corporal John Hammond, who, despite serious shrapnel wounds to his legs and without a stitch of clothing, staggered along the pier. I was only wearing a watch and one identification tag. All my clothes had all been blasted off, and uh, a naval officer came along. He said, I've just room for two more. He said, if you're quick, you can come. So we hopped along as hard as we could. Got to the end of the mall, couldn't see any boat. Looking at where is it, where is it? Oh, it's down there. <laughs> the tide must have been out, you see. And so I looked down, and there's a great big hairy chested sailor there. He just shouted to me, jump, mate, jump. Well, I didn't jump, I just fell off, you see. I, I, right into his arms, and that was that. I was passed over the heads of everybody and uh, round the boat and down some gangway and down below. As soon as I got settled down below, a young sailor boy came along with a mug of uh, cocoa and a slice of dry bread. He apologised for not having butter on the bread. Honestly, it is over the medal. He was only a boy. Some men escaped at the first attempt. Others suffered the horror of being bombed on more than one ship. We'd got to the mole uh, and directed along, you know, marshaled along the mole to get on the first ship that was there. Uh, we dumped our kit and uh, it was whilst we were down below that, uh, that the ship got bombed. Anyway, it was when we were down below that, you know, <laughs> boom, and the, the whole ship was shaking. Then we had to get off that and uh, make our way to the ship was at the rear, which uh, was a paddle steamer, and that was the Crested Eagle. The Stokers came in with the screaming bombs. They dived from between two and 3,000 feet. Uh, straight down, and the first bomb went down the funnel, the uh, Pressed Eagle, and it was all uh, making up steam to pull away, and it just blew that uh, boiler. And uh, the lot, and they got scalded, those that were alive and helping, and, and the bodies, and just collapsed like that. I, from what I can gather, it hit the engine room. That was, and uh, you know, I got blown back along this passageway, and by the time I picked myself up, you know, obviously there was a lot of confusion. 
But I found one of my mates, Frank Cleverly, and then we started to look for uh, Ron Booker, but we couldn't find him at all. Anyway, Frank and I made our way up to the deck again, and uh, of course everybody was jumping off, so we took our boots off and uh, jumped off. <laughs> Of the 50 French and British destroyers that went to Dunkirk, nine were sunk and 25 damaged. One hospital ship was sunk and five others damaged. Over 200 merchant ships were lost. Really, I suppose it wasn't until the next morning that uh, you realised how bad it was when you saw the bodies that were floating up against the, uh, uh, on the shoreline. While all this was going on, what was happening in England was, was uh, that the populace was being deceived by, by uh, optimistic propaganda which, which intimated that we were still winning over there. Even, even to the very end of, of May, people were being told that the Germans were being driven back and the Germans were being held. And then the propaganda grew weaker and weaker and then the truth could no longer be contained once the troops was streaming back to Britain. It had to be admitted that we had been forced to evacuate. But that evacuation became, as we've all seen, a glorious exercise in British history. OK, she's free. Let her go, Stern. What are you doing with my husband's boat? Bring it back at once. I'm sorry, ma'am. She's commandeered. Time was running out. Boats with shallow draft were desperately needed to reach the men on the beaches and ferry them out to the transports at sea. As word spread, people started to volunteer, and in the last days, the trickle of vessels grew to a deluge. Over a hundred of the now famous little ships of Dunkirk were assembled here at Tufts Boatyard on the Thames at Teddington. I once described it uh, as a lunatic armada, and I think that's what it was. Um, it was every conceivable kind of boat, from spritzel barges, you know, the, the big classic Thames barges in trade, which were, of course, extremely useful because they're flat-bottomed and have huge hulls, and they would have got hundreds of chaps aboard, I'm sure, to uh, lifeboats, uh, tugs, um, just every conceivable kind of craft. My father received a call from the Admiralty that he had got to go up and commandeer all the boats that he thought would be suitable of a short sea crossing. So he went off with the tug and uh, his men went off with the tug and any boat that looked suitable, they just took it. Some of the surviving vessels were used in the 1958 Dunkirk film. There population were not prepared to leave our soldiers over the other side and they inevitably set out in the boats they got the message they originally thought they were only taking them down to Sheerness it wasn't until they got down to Sheerness they realized that the troops were on the other side of the channel and uh, they, they had to be picked up and a lot of people who were really entirely incapable took boats over and did wonderful feats of navigation and, and uh, generally speaking did a, a, a terrific job there were all sorts of boats, just ordinary rowing boats and little uh, pleasure boats and every conceivable craft that you'd use on a holiday. And uh, I always remember seeing the Duchess of Cornwall, a little, pretty little ship, and the Duchess of Devonshire. And they were pretty little ships with red funnels and the sort of thing you went round the bay and back for tea type of thing. They were there. I scrambled down into this large boat and this was one of those boats that had been hastily towed over from Gravesend or Ramsgate, manned by two of the volunteers. Now, these two seamen, I uh, call them seamen because they behaved as such, were, as far as I could tell, elderly men. They reminded me of uh, retired stockbrokers or uh, weekend yachtsmen, not to be derogatory, but they reminded me as middle-aged gents who liked to be uh, handy about a boat. As soon as I got aboard, they automatically relinquished command to me. I took the wheel, one went forward, one went aft, 
and we were a boat's crew. I don't think we exchanged a word. In fact, we were together for three or four days and nights, and I don't think one word passed between us. That was the way things were. There was one occasion I vividly remember I was towing out a large, I think it must have been a ship's lifeboat, full of soldiers. And of course I was looking ahead, looking to find a ship to go alongside. And I heard shouts coming from aft, turn round, and it appears that this lifeboat was sinking. I think I must have towed her over a submerged lorry. I must have ripped her bottom out. However, we got this sinking boat alongside a destroyer, made fast, and as her half-drowned and some injured soldiers were scrambling up the scrambling nets, the destroyer suddenly went full speed ahead. From lying motionless, she was away, full speed ahead. Of course, she was towing us with us. We couldn't rescue anybody. Soldiers were tipped into the water, drowning, but we were going ahead on, on the end of a tow line. Uh, soon became apparent why she did this. Some bombs came whistling down right onto the spot where she was stationary a few minutes ago. They'd seen the bomber coming over and decided to move. There was another of the many tragedies going on all the time. Some of these soldiers wading out to get nearer to England, nearer to a boat. Some of these soldiers were wading out to their necks and they had army overcoats on and they were weary and tired and they were just collapsing, just sinking into the water. I saw it dozens of times. Later on, days or nights, no idea how the time went, but later on, <clears throat> we found ourselves in a lull. Suddenly everything had gone quiet. We seemed to be a long way from ships. And for the first time, these two yachtsmen, I call them, and I looked at each other, and I think we all said the same thing together. Well, this is it, let's go home. And we were so tired and so stupid that we hadn't got the sense to pick up 20 or 30 soldiers and take them with us. But that's the way it went, and that's one of my big regrets. By the end of the sixth day, nearly 200,000 men had been rescued, but only 15,000 had been French. As late as the 29th of May, the French Admiral at Dunkirk had been amazed to discover that the BEF was pulling out. An embarrassed Winston Churchill now promised the French Premier, Paul Renault, that the final embarkations would be in equal numbers. But the damage had been done. The accusation was there to be made. The British were running out on their allies. Arguably, the most lasting legacy of the events of 1940, which you may say has persisted to this day, was of a deep sense of betrayal uh, by the French, that they've always believed that Perfide Albion once again let them down. And in a sense, we did. And in a sense, we were less than honest about what we were at with their high command. Partly, of course, uh, partly as a, as a great believer in the cock-up rather than the conspiracy theory of history. This was because communications at a high level were so bad at this stage that I think many British commanders weren't willfully misleading the French. They just literally forgot to tell them. But there's little doubt that even if the BEF had stayed, the only consequence would have been that it would have fallen into the hands of the Germans instead of being saved to fight another day. The evacuation continued until the night of the 3rd of June, when the last of the French and British rearguard ran out of ammunition and was forced to surrender. In nine days, the final number of men brought back to England was almost 340,000, over seven times more than the initial target. That was the miracle of Dunkirk. Operation Dynamo had been an unprecedented success. But everyone knew as they saw the pathetic pictures of an exhausted and battered army that Britain now stood alone. This was the darkest hour, and people held their breath and wondered what would happen next.
ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister. We shall defend our island, and with the British Empire around us, we shall fight on, unconquerable, until the curse of Hitler is lifted from the brows of men. We are sure that in the end, all will be well. Well, we were offloaded from the hospital train into uh, ambulances, and we drove through Middlesbrough. And I'm sure the entire population was there, lined, lining the streets. And... Sorry. dug out the earth from under the Anderson shelter to lower it down another two or three feet. I thought if that was happening to Dunkirk, it's our turn next. And it was true. Churchill was very quick to point out that wars are not won by evacuations. He went on to make his famous speech to the House of Commons about fighting them on the beaches in the streets and we shall never surrender. It was uh, perhaps his most famous speech and at the request of Ed Morrow, went along to the BBC later that day to make it again for the benefit of the American public. At the end of the speech, he clapped his hand over the microphone and said to Ed Morrow, and uh, if they do come, we shall have to hit them on the head with beer bottles, because that's all we've got. Churchill's extraordinary persuasive powers, his extraordinary ability first to make the British rise to the, the moment, and secondly, to make them believe in themselves uh, I, I think it's one of the great achievements of history for which I don't believe all the revisionist historians in the world will be able to take away from him. More than 68,000 British servicemen were killed or taken prisoner. Had it not been for the first French army who held the final rearguard at Dunkirk, the losses would have been far worse. As it was, two weeks later, France herself was forced to surrender. It was uh, the futility of it all. We lost so many people. I've never got over that. The situation should never have arisen. That's the point. That situation should never have arisen if we'd been sent over properly equipped, properly led, uh, properly trained, uh, and up to date. The Blitzkrieg would have been expected and we would have been able to deal with it. And that's the sort of thing that uh, is upsetting. <laughs>